Welcome to Growing in the Gospel. I'm Pastor Kerry. You've clicked play on a long-form teaching series called Cultivating a Healthy Soul. Today, we're going to discover soul health. What does it mean to flourish from the inside out? This study is part five of this series, so I hope if you're catching this one alone, you'll go back and catch parts one through four, and that you'll stay with us during the 11-part journey. This is for you. It's for those you love. I hope you'll share it. Use it with a small group or a group of friends to study God's Word, especially a study, what is our journey, our nurturing journey by the grace of God. So let's press into now part five, soul health. Well, I got to have a new experience, first time experience in my life. I got to have a stress test this week. Anybody have one of those recently? Those were quite an adventure. Amazing technology um, that you can go in, and I, I did not really know what to expect. Dana had had one before, and this, don't worry, I'm, I'm fine. Um, that's what I said before I got cancer too. Um, but, but I had cancer 10 years ago, and they told me when I had the treatments, they, they said, now this particular chemical can create issues with your heart like 10 years out. And so I'm just kind of going through some preventative stuff to find out, you know, do I have anything to worry about? I don't think I do. The doctor doesn't think I do. So don't worry about that. That's a distraction to the point of my story. Um, but I got to go in for this stress test. So the doctor said, we can, pretty much anything we need to know, um, we, you know, we can, we can assess from that. So I went in on Friday and Got there at nine. I thought it was just a real simple EKG, run a minute on the treadmill. It's much more involved than that. And there's a lot more technology um, related to it. So get there, they hooked me up to, to this EKG, all these cables coming off of me. I felt a little bit bionic at that moment. Um, and then they stand me up on this treadmill. They got three people in the room. One of them standing right behind me, a big guy. I think he was there to catch me if anything happened, you know. Um, and they make me sign a waiver that what they're about to do can create a heart attack. Um, so then I'm standing up there and I'm doing my thing and I'm walking and my heart rate's going up and, and then they were, had me running. And it was amazing to just watch these people go to work diagnosing. You know, that's their whole mission is without opening me up to, to try to get inside of me with everything they can and to figure out and to see as clearly as they can what's going on. Is this thing pumping the way it should pump? Uh, is the blood flow right? Is the rhythm right? Do the valves work? Is there scar tissue? Is there, you know, other, other factors? What's really going on in there? And um, they can, you know, they're looking at the, at the wave. They're looking at heart rate. They're looking at oxygen, saturation, and stuff. I mean, people in the room are much more smart, much smarter, <laughs> more smarter than me in this stuff. Um, they, they're, they're, you guys are way ahead of me on some of the, this terminology. Well, after that was done, I thought, okay, they're gonna send me home. They said, okay, now go next door for nuclear imaging. So they took me over to another room and a guy all geared up, opens this metal container, takes out what's called a radioactive isotope. Um, so that's what's supposed to give me my Hulk-like qualities, I think. Um, incredible, you know, I, I said to my wife yesterday, it's a good thing I'm not angry. You wouldn't like me now when I get angry. I turn green and split my shirt open. And uh, you guys are a little asleep today. I think this is hilarious, but... Um, <laughs> That's okay, I laugh at my own stuff. Um, so they inject me with this radioactive isotope, I lay down, they could take a nuclear image of my heart. I'm still not done. Now I gotta wait a while, then they send me across the hall uh, for a CT scan of the heart. And the guy said this, this is, this is mind blowing. We can take the nuclear image of your heart and the, and the CT image of your heart and we can meld them together to get this comprehensive idea, you know. I came back to Dana, I said, Dana, everybody at the hospital just keeps telling me I have a really good heart. She went, you know, okay. So, um, but it was just amazing to me the diagnostic power, the ability that they had to assess, okay? And like I said, everything looks good, so don't worry. But I'm really prayerful that this series will, number one, help you understand that you have an internal life that is as sign more significant than your physiology, okay? And like you would give attention to some internal system, like your, your, like your pulmonary function, or like your cardiac function, or your digestive function, you would give attention. If things are not functioning properly, again, unless you're delusional and just don't wanna know the truth, and you'd rather die sooner, you don't ignore those things. We have 
uh, resources and, and expanding and growing knowledge base. And so you, you take what you're experiencing and you go to the tools and the resources to, to objectively look at your physiology and to diagnose what's going on. And what I, one of the things I want you to understand in this study is that your soul can be treated as objectively and should be. But most of us don't look at, at our mind, will, and emotions and that inner life as something that we can kind of differentiate and look at objectively. But you can. God wants you to. He wants you to understand your soul. He wants you to understand the needs and how to cultivate and how to grow and how to, how to address, how to diagnose what's going on inside. What are the warning lights on the dashboard of your life when your soul is heading the wrong direction? What are the corrective actions you can take? Um, the fact is, if they did find something out going on with my cardiology system, cardiac system, there's probably a treatment, there's probably something I can do. Maybe there's a dietary adjustment, maybe there's um, a prescription, maybe there's some other lifestyle change. There's, there's ways to address, when you find something early, the best time to find it is early, right? I'm really glad when they found my cancer, they said it's stage two. Now, it could have been diagnosed even earlier, um, but it was good that it was found as early as it was. So the earlier, the better when it comes to these things. And so it is with your soul. Left neglected, your soul on a bad road can really create some destruction in your own life and in the lives of others. But on a healthy road, on a cultivating road, you know, for a long time, it produces this word we're gonna study today, flourishing. So the question before us is, what is soul health? What does it mean to flourish? What's the end game? I wanna try to make it worth it for you to devote yourself to soul, to biblical principles for soul health, that you'll just stay on that road. And like, like, like a doctor would try to get you to, to, to fix your diet, fix your exercise, fix your sleep patterns, fix your lifestyle, so that you can have the most predictable health track possible. So I believe that there's real good reason to be motivated, deeply motivated, to care for and to address our souls. Look at Psalm 92. This is our text for today. It's one of my favorite psalms. I just love this one. And our text, our key text we're gonna focus on is verses 12 through 14. But I want you to read verse 15 as well, okay? So read it out loud with me. Verse 12, Psalm 92, verse 12 through verse 15. Ready, begin. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. There is no unrighteousness in him. Now there's two kinds of flourishing in this particular psalm. I want you to see the first one is in verse seven. And I call it fake flourishing, okay? It says, when the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is as they shall be destroyed, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. Now, there's a contrast in this psalm. And the contrast is the words wicked and righteous. Big concepts, but it really boils down to this. Righteousness in scripture is what just was sung, it's never achieved, it's always received. So wickedness is the rejection of God's solution for sin, rejecting God's salvation through Jesus, rejecting the cross, rejecting the, <clears throat> excuse me, imputed righteousness, the conferred righteousness. Sorry, I got a cough. Okay. It is, um, so that's God's definition of wicked. It's to say, I don't need God to make me righteous. I'm good enough. That's God's definition of wickedness. And it leads to what he talks about here, the workers, you know, working iniquity. It leads to all kinds of sin and idolatry. What the psalmist then contrasts is the righteous. The righteous are not the, it's not good people versus bad people. This is faith people versus faithless people. People who have said, God, I, I need forgiveness. I come to you needy. I come to you broken. I come to you messy. Would you make me righteous? 
by the blood, by Jesus, by the cross, by the coming sacrifice. This is an Old Testament psalm. So by the, you know, looking forward to the cross. So a righteous man in God's sight is not one that's been good enough for God to say, you did a good job, A plus. No, it's God saying, I'm calling you righteous because of your faith. The just shall live by faith. So we need to understand that. But God says in Psalm 92, 7, that the wicked or the unrighteous, there is a kind of flourishing that, and the root word here means to twinkle. To twinkle, okay? And you can see the context because the, the contrast is they flourish like grass, when the wicked spring as grass. So the picture here is a blade of grass. Think about how quick it grows. Think about how shallow it's rooted and how brief its life really is. In contrast to the next kind of flourishing, which is true flourishing, and that's profiled in verse 12, 13, and 14. The righteous shall flourish like, okay, here's the contrast, not a, not a blade of grass. It's not gonna twinkle for a moment. It's not just gonna fly by night. No, this is a kind of flourishing that's like, again, like Psalm 1, a tree, a palm tree that grows down and up and out, and it grows strong. And then it says he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. These are trees that Lebanon was known for, these giant cedar trees that they would bring down to Israel for construction purposes. Their biggest structures were built out of these cedars. So an ancient Israelite singing this psalm on the Sabbath would have had this, this beautiful contrast that if I, if I go the wrong way in life, then it's, there's gonna be a temporary pleasure in sin, like fleeting, twinkling flourishing. It's gonna be short-lived. But if I really go with God on this, on this formula, if I really follow him, there's gonna be a deeper, broader, richer, truer kind of flourishing like a tree. Okay, the word flourish means to break forth, to bud, to bloom abundantly, to spread out, and eventually to fly, which is, I think, a cool picture. So I've got three thoughts to share with you about flourishing. I just want to unpack this idea of flourishing. Why should, it, why should you care about it? Okay. Um, number one, you guys there? Okay. We went late for a service. I'm really going to try to fly through this, and I apologize. We started late. I have an issue, okay? It's, I just lose track of time. Number one, a flourishing soul is first a needy soul. Now, this is really critical. You, your soul is deeply needy. Mine is. We all have it. Not, not a single person in this room has a soul that isn't desperately needy. Okay. And there are lots of places in Scripture where the, the scripture, descriptors show up that help me understand that my soul is needy. My problem is I used to read these passages through the wrong lens. I used to read them as directives instead of as desperate cries, okay? So, for instance, Psalm 84. How amiable or desirable or how wonderful are thy tabernacles. That's a, just a word for your, any place that God is, God's presence, okay? O Lord of hosts, my soul longeth, yea, fainteth for the courts of the Lord. Or a modern vernacular would be for the presence of God. My soul is desperately longing, it's, it's fainting, it's emaciated without the presence of God. He says, um, my heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Later in verse five, blessed, that's this full joy. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, okay, who brings his weakness to you, God, and suddenly you provide the source of strength. Verse seven, they go from strength to strength. Verse six is a, is a word picture that they never run out of water even in the most desert barren places, okay? Look at Psalm 42, one and two. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Psalm 63, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. That's where we live, right there. No water in this secular world for the soul. They don't even believe you have one. Okay. So I want you to catch this, though. For so many years of my life, I read verses like this as a directive. Oh, I'm supposed to thirst more for God. Okay, so then I would take the directive and turn it into effort. Okay, I'm going to try to be thirsty. Have you ever tried to be thirsty? 
Have you ever tried to be hungry? Have you ever had to work at being thirsty or hungry? No. These things materialize, okay? So if we go at every verse, if we go at every scripture, like where's my command? Where's the directive here? What am I supposed to work on? We really go at the Bible sometimes asking the wrong questions, okay? Now there's lots of instructional passages that are directive oriented. I'm not diminishing those. When God has a command, we ought to follow it, okay? But I'm saying it's wrong for us to impose that onto every part of scripture because this is not a directive, it's a desperate cry. It's desperation. The psalmist is saying, God, I'm thirsting. I'm craving, I'm longing, I'm needy, I'm weak. I need, and it's brilliant because he has come to the point in his life where he realizes nothing can fill this particular kind of need except God. So it's an admission of deep need and the recognition that only God can fill this, so he's running to God with it. Do you, do you catch that? And that's profound, it's powerful, it's transformational because we don't like to admit that we're needy. Every time I've ever met with a couple that were dealing with any kind of marriage struggles, usually the husband, about in the first 10 minutes of the, of the appointment, lets out some blustery kind of self-centered sigh. <sighs> Like he's so disgusted with God's daughter that God loaned him. And he says these words, and I, I just despise these, these words. Oh, she's just so needy. And I'm telling you, I don't do a lot of marriage counseling because I get into it too much. And I just want to reach over the desk and smack that guy or grab something and hit him. And I want to go, okay, number one, what did you think you were marrying? Like, you could have married a bowling ball or a telephone pole. They have less needs. <laughs> this is a human being. Idiot. You know, that's what I want to say. I'm thinking it. This is a human being. And then I want to go, you know what? I bet she would tell me you're pretty needy too, pal. Because the husbands are usually more needy than the wives. But they're completely blind to it. Their pride has blinded them to the fact that they are deeply needy. So listen, let's just start right here, okay? <laughs> you are needy. I am needy. Author John Ortberg uses a movie narrative and a character of a movie to illustrate this principle. The movie is What About Bob? The leading character, Richard Dreyfus, plays a psychologist and he takes on a new patient who's played by Bill Murray. His name is Bob, Bob Wiley. Bob Wiley has a lot of problems. And over the course of the movie, he becomes, I don't even know the word, codependent, uh, dependent, extremely dependent. He becomes strangely dependent on his psychologist, okay? That's a comedy. Well, in their first meeting, which Bob frantically worked to set up, the script unfolds this way. Um, Richard Dreyfus asked the character Bob, so you know, why are we meeting today? And Bob says, the simplest way to put it, I have problems. Now, this actually reminds me of the pandemic year. It's a little too close to home. The next phrase, I worry about diseases, so I have trouble touching things. I have a real big problem moving and he says, talk about moving, psychiatrist. Bob says, well, in my apartment, I'm fine, but when I go out, I get weird. Psychologist says, well, talk about weird. He says, I get dizzy spells, nausea, cold sweats, hot sweats, fever blisters, difficulty breathing, difficulty swallowing, blurred vision, involuntary trembling, dead hands, numb lips, fingernail sensitivity, it's okay to laugh, okay? You guys are like, this is me, okay. <laughs> this is the last year of my life, Pastor. It's way too close to home, okay. So then the psychologist says, okay, but the question is, Bob, 
What is it that you are truly afraid of? And Bob says, what if my heart stops beating? What if I'm looking for a bathroom and can't find one? What if my bladder explodes? <laughs> and, the, and his list of what ifs continues to unfold. And then Ortberg says, your soul is Bob. And that just brings it to life to me. Oh, yeah, your soul is really desperate. One author who profiled the, the Hebrew words for mankind or man, uh, the life of man in the Old Testament, he broke these three words down this way. Basar is translated most often as flesh. It talks about your physical body. Ruah is most often about your spirit. And soul is often, the word nefesh is soul. It's translated soul. And he characterized soul. Basar is physical man. Ruah is spiritual man. Nefesh is needy man. Never satisfied. Always needing. Always needing security. Satisfaction. Fullness. Gratification. Looking for joy. Looking for happiness. Never full. And here's the deal. Every one of those needs, every one of those soul needs, number one, they're legitimate. But number two, they're arrows pointing us to God. But there's two problems when it comes to these needs. The first is we don't like to admit that we have them. We want to see ourselves as strong, self-sufficient, put together. We work hard to feel like we're in control. We expect those closest to us to be strong, put together, in control, and ready to meet our needs. And the fact of the matter is, the most combustible parts of our lives and our relationships, the outbursts, the anger, the tension, the frustration, you know what, most often what that is? It's warning lights on your dashboard that your soul needs something that it's not finding where it's looking for it. This is a lot of times what anger is in a relationship. Okay, uh, Dana was in the first service. I use this as an example. There have been many times in our marriage that I've not been meeting a need she expected me to meet or she's not been meeting a need I expected her to meet. We don't even know really that we have those needs. We don't look at them objectively and differentiate them. They just kind of operate in us, kind of subconsciously. But we know when they're not being met. We know when we're thirsty. We know when we're hungry. We know when our emotional, relational needs are not being met. And so then we start to get frustrated and agitated and irritated at the person that's supposed to be, or we think is supposed to be meeting them. And then when that continues to break, eventually we're gonna explode. Eventually we're gonna get angry. And a lot of times that relational conflict, that anger is simply desperation. It's soul desperation saying, oh, no, I need something and you're not giving it to me. And I think you're supposed to. It's desperation. And a big part of navigating through that when you're the recipient of that is realizing this, person, this person's emotional trigger of this anger that I'm experiencing is really just a surface fruit of a deeper issue going on. There's a need, there's a desperate cry. You know, most wives, when they're angry at their husbands, and the husband's like, like, I remember one time Dana said, why don't you just hug me? And I'm like, you're gonna break my neck if I hug you. And what she was saying is, help me. That's, that's the cry, the cry of our soul, okay? And we've all been there. We've all been there in our relationships where the person we expect to meet our needs isn't meeting them sufficiently. Well, this is... Healthy soul goes to God for those deepest needs, those, those, those needs that no human being could ever really fully meet and satisfy. There's a set of needs in your soul that only God can fully satisfy. But admitting that you have them is, is huge. Admitting and being willing to see yourself as weak, sin sick, struggling, instead of trying to convince yourself and everybody else that you're okay and you're put together, that's the first step, swallowing your pride and admitting, okay, I have issues. I have needs. My soul has needs. Now, the good news is God has enough grace to meet all of your needs. And I'm going to quote Ortberg again. He says, the soul's infinite capacity to desire is the mirror image of God's infinite capacity to give. What if the real reason we feel like we never have enough 
is that God has not yet finished giving. Unlimited neediness of the soul matches the unlimited grace of God. So if you're taking notes, just write, unlimited neediness meets unlimited grace. Which brings me to point two. And the second problem of our soul needs. The first is we don't want to admit that we have them. Okay? But the second is, where do we go with them? Truly, where do we go? Because most often we go to things and people. But this is where verse 13 shines light into the matter. A flourishing soul is a planted soul. And in some ways, we're, we're touching on these themes in different ways and different messages. I know we've talked about being rooted and grounded in Christ, but we're going to see it through a different lens right now. A flourishing soul is a planted soul. Though, look at verse 13. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. Now, the, the literal picture is the psalmist probably somewhere in proximity to the temple in Jerusalem looking at the trees and the, and the greenery planted all around that temple and the staff of Levites and priests and all the people that were designated to care for that space. And the idea, it's a metaphor, it's a word picture of saying, look how strong those trees are. Look how fruitful those trees are. Look how well cared for those trees are that have been planted in this temple grounds. And now he's drawing the, 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 whole, the carryover is, God, if I'm planted in you that way, you're going you're gonna to cultivate me and care for me and provide for me. You're going to let me be rooted in your very presence and in your source of endless supply and grace. And as I cultivate that root system, I'm, gonna, I'm going to grow. Look what he says, verse 13, shall flourish. In the, so the word flourish, this is that long, durable flourishing. And so the planting answers the question, where do I go with my needs? What do I do with them? And here's a statement that makes it really accessible to me. Tim Keller wrote, we are all governed by an overwhelming positive passion. Overwhelming positive passion. That's where you are planted. That's, the, that's where you've planted yourself. If that overwhelming positive passion is anything other than God and his purposes, that's called idolatry. It means you've taken your core needs and you've gone to something or someone else to gratify and satisfy them, which will prove to be insufficient. You will come up thirsty, and when you come up thirsty, you're gonna be sorely disappointed in that person or thing you planted your, your hopes, your heart, your soul, your needs in. You're gonna be disappointed in them. This happens in every marriage. Too much of my soul planted in this relationship, then I find out this person is as broken and needy as I am, and we imperfectly meet each other's needs, and so the strength of the marriage is when two people go deep in Christ, come full to the marriage and begin to pour into each other instead of just screaming and yelling and demanding from each other. It's a dramatically different kind of marriage. But this plays out in your whole life. I'm just using the marriage as a metaphor, as an illustration. The psalmist says, plant yourself in a way that will lead to and produce flourishing. This overwhelming positive passion. One biblical illustration is Jacob working seven years to marry Rachel. Remember that story in Genesis? Seven years, and the Bible says they were but as a few days. This is that driver of life that just causes time to fly by in most respects because it so consumes you. It so drives you. Another one, another example of this is Zacchaeus. When Jesus met Zacchaeus, the primary driver of his life was money. He, he, he was dishonest and thieving and covetous. He was defined by his passion and pursuit for money to the point that he was a traitor to his own people. Jesus has lunch with him. In turn, he finds out the gospel, places his trust and faith in Christ, and his soul is completely transformed. And 
at the end of lunch, he says, I'm gonna pay back everybody I ever stole from, four times what I took from them. I'm gonna give half my, I mean, he just, he becomes lavish and generous. That thing that defined him, that core soul pursuit of money that had a stranglehold on him and turned, shriveled him up into an emaciated sick soul was broken free. The grip was broken. And suddenly he became generous. Why? Because he found something in Jesus that brought a flourishing to his life that was liberating. It set him free. And he didn't have to be hostage to lesser lords or lesser gods or idols. The soul always has a single driving passion and it orbits around that passion. It cannot orbit around itself. Any, other, any orbit other than God becomes an idol and that's a substitute for true flourishing. But here's the thing. Like I don't always really know what's going on with the pumping and the beating of my heart and the valves and the arteries and the blood flow. Like I, I need to go jump up on a treadmill and hook up to diagnostic imaging to, to see. I want you to jump up on the treadmill for a minute. I want you to let God do some diagnostic imaging of your heart. I put some diagnostic questions in your outline. Read them with me. And I encourage you, this is your assignment for the week, okay? Think about these this week. What do I spend most of my time thinking about? What consumes you? Money, romance, material things, politics, power? What do I truly believe will make me happy? You know, like I, I know Jesus is good, but what do I truly believe will make me happy? Number three, what wins first place? What wins when valuable priorities conflict? When it's work against home, does work always win? When it's sports against church, do sports always win? When it's Netflix against, I mean, you fill in the blanks. I don't even know. But when competing priorities, does God's value system drive? Does does living under his leadership, have I planted myself in him? Is that, the, is that the core pursuit? Okay, next. What aspects of my life do I most work to hide or cover up or avoid? What, what do I ignore? It's like I know there's a problem, but I don't want to deal with it. What fires me up? What most easily animates me? What, like, what, what, what are you willing to fight for? What do you get defensive about? That's what I'm kind of driving at there. And it could be a positive animation like go team, and it could be kind of a negative, what, what makes you, you know, edgy? What do you get really? Have you talked to anybody this year about politics? <laughs> or mask wearing or vaccines or I mean, social justice issues? And there are people. Now listen, I, I think this is one of the reasons our church has stayed healthy. And I pray this is a reflection of your spiritual maturity. You, I'm sure everybody in this room has their opinion about vaccines, masks, politics, social justice, in lots of ways, but you haven't let those become defining pursuits. Why? Why do I know that? Because they haven't divided you from Christian friends and brothers with whom we labor together for the sake of the gospel. That's, that's, the bottom, that's, that, that's a test that, that hasn't gone that deep. It's, it's fine to be passionate about these things, but I'm talking about that driving passion, that single passion. And a healthy church, frankly, is a whole body of people that have said, our driving passion is Jesus, our driving passion is the gospel, and we're not gonna die on lesser hills, we're not gonna become divided on, on inconsequential matters of preference, even though we might feel passionately about them. What aspects of my life do I you know, get animated about? What, what would I not give to follow Jesus? That's a tough one. Mm. When my brother Matt was little, he had a little stuffed animal, a little bear, and had plastic hand, and, and uh, a banana in one, and thumb out on the other, and it would suck its thumb. Some of you might remember those little stuffed bears. And he named his bear Sucky Bear, because it sucked its thumb. Man, he loved that bear. And one day my dad was trying to teach Matt about Jesus being the one we follow, the core pursuit of our lives, and Matt was probably four. And he's, and he's trying to help Matt understand, you know, surrender and trusting the Lord. And, and, and he's, he, okay, well, you know, if G, you know, would you love Jesus enough to give up? And he's trying to find something that in Matt's world, so he, go, he just remembered Sucky Bear. Matt, what if Jesus wanted you to give up Sucky Bear? Would you give up Sucky Bear for Jesus? Matt said, no. 
No way. He actually says, on the, it's, it's cute on the recording, he goes, I love Sucky Bear. And then a few questions later, he finally came full circle, where dad said, now listen, if Jesus really wanted you, and finally Matt goes, yeah, yeah, I guess I would. <laughs> but so painful. Okay, what is it in your life that if, if Jesus said, follow me, that you would find it incredibly difficult or nearly impossible to walk away or give up? One thing, what's the one thing that comes in the way of you really, really devoting yourself to the Lord? These things are called idols. And Paul said, flee from idolatry. My, and John said, my little children, keep yourself from idols. So back to the planting idea. Choosing to plant yourself in the house or in the presence or in the pursuit of God is to turn from idols and to turn towards. It's to turn towards the one. It's to recognize I'm a needy soul and God's the only one who can really meet those needs deeply. Okay, which brings me to part three, and we're done. This is quick. A flourishing soul is needy. A flourishing soul is planted. Thirdly, this is the outflow. A flourishing soul will be fruit-bearing. I want you to see verse 14 where it picks up. They shall... So the psalmist is contrasting the person that chooses that, that core pursuit. And he says, those people will still bring forth fruit in an old age. Okay, now the immediate picture is, the assumption of most of our lives is as we age, we lose fruitfulness. That's not just physiological in our ability to procreate. But we think of life winding down but that's not God's sense of it. This guy, this psalmist says, no, this person has a quality of soul, this long road that is long in fruitfulness. F fruitful in old age. They shall be fat. That's not talking about weight. Some of you are like, I know some people that are already there, man, they must know. It's not talking about weight, okay. And flourishing. Why? To show that the Lord is upright. He's my rock and there's no unrighteousness in him. So what does this true long road of flourishing, planting, and coming back to this core pursuit, turning away from idols, guarding my heart, and, and, and staying continually devoted, okay? Well, number one word the Bible uses is fruit. I'm looking at verse 14, okay? Fruit, and the root word means germinated cheerfulness, okay? It's talking about emotional, psychological, and fruit of character and heart that continually germinates, okay, um, from an internal source. The second word is old age. So I use the word fullness because the concept there is that it's an enduring, patient usefulness. Like the soul doesn't out out age its usefulness. This soul is flourishing in full. The third word is fat, so I put fatness, okay? And that is vigor and health, it's energy, it's sustained energy and purpose. And the fourth word at the end of the, the phrase is flourishing. And that particular word, that root word, is perpetually green, perpetually alive, perpetually renewing its strength, okay? It, you remember the rhythm series how we talked about seasons? The implication of this word is that the soul, as it matures, the seasons become less dramatic and it becomes kind of an evergreen. That it's always renewed, always renewed. The soul is all, the needs of the soul are always met and you never outlive the fruitfulness of your life. The soul never, uh, it, it doesn't outlive its ability to bear fruit and to be renewed. And my friend, I wanna land here, you have in Jesus, everything your soul needs, and you have everything that the souls around you need because the, the design of this is that because you begin to be flourishing, you show, that's the last verse in the psalm, you show God's faithfulness, God's provision, God's goodness. Essentially, you become a mirror image of the gospel. The gospel that supplies your soul becomes a reflection to the lost world that sees because it's well with your soul, I, 
let me in on the secret. What have you tied into? What have you planted in? What, have, what, have, what, what is it that's supplying you with such renewing strength and joy? You know the song. We sing it often around here. It is well with my soul. And you may have heard the story before, but let me take a minute and share it with you before we go. Wealthy Chicago lawyer and businessman, Horatio Spafford. His four-year-old son, he had five children. At the time of the Chicago fire, his four-year-old son was killed and most of his wealth was destroyed because it was in property. And so, in response to this devastating loss, Horatio asked his wife, Anna, and his four daughters, they were gonna go as a family to England. They were gonna help D.L. Moody to conduct evangelistic campaigns in England. They were friends of Moody. Spafford was a co-investor in Moody's works. And so, right at the last minute, Spafford got delayed because of some business matters, so he said to his wife and kids to go ahead over on the steamship, and he would meet them later. Well, most of you know the story that midway across the Atlantic, their ship collided with a British steamer, and within minutes, the ship sank, and all four of the Spafford daughters perished at sea in the Atlantic Ocean. Anna Spafford was rescued. She was floating unconscious on a piece of wreckage, wreckage and rescued, and when she got to her destination, she sent a telegram back to her husband, Horatio. And this is in a time when you know, travel took a long time and communication took a long time. And the telegram is pictured here and it says, the first two words, saved alone, what shall I do? And then she gives some instructions on how he can find her and where she's gonna be as he comes across the Atlantic. Well, not long after, Spafford, grieving the loss of his daughters, crossing the Atlantic, came to near the place where the ship sank and where his daughters perished, and he sat down in his stateroom and he penned the hymn that we still sing today called, It Is Well With My Soul. Look at these words. Think about a man who's got devastating loss, five children he lost now, one in a fire, four at sea. And this is not the end of his troubles. He's gonna have more after the story continues. But he sat down, he wrote these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, or sorrow like sea billows roll. The two contrasts. Whatever my lot, whatever my circumstances, you've taught me to say, do you see the planting? You're my God. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet and trials should come, let this blessed assurance control. Soul, you're under the control of a higher assurance. That Christ, Jesus, has regarded my helpless estate and shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, now he dives into the gospel. My sin, oh, the bliss, the explosive joy of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Not, not just some of my sins, all of my sin is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. I'll see those girls again, I'll see that son again. We don't usually sing this verse, but Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. The sky, not the grave, is our goal. O trump of the angel, O voice of the Lord, blessed hope, blessed rest of my soul. And then this is my favorite verse. Lord, haste the day. Hurry up. When the faith shall be sight. The clouds roll back as a scroll. The trump shall resound. The Lord shall descend. Even so, say it out loud. It is well with my soul. My friend, you have a needy soul. You're gonna take your needs somewhere. But there's only one someplace, someone who can truly meet those needs. Plant yourself there, you're on a good road to real, long flourishing. Well, soul health begins by falling onto Jesus, collapsing into his grace and mercy, receiving the life that he puts within us, but then soul health is cultivated, it's sustained over time by prioritizing Jesus, by keeping him preeminent, and by allowing our souls to absorb his truth, it's exactly what you're doing, frankly, right now. So this concludes part five of our series, Cultivating a Healthy Soul. Feel free to share a comment or a question. 
I hope you'll share the series and use this as a resource to help other believers grow, maybe in a small group or study with friends. And I look forward to seeing you in part six.